Welcome to another episode of Cosmic Conversations. I'm your hostess, Marla Martinson, and I'm so excited about this conversation today. I am with Marcel Pick, MSN, OBGYN, and NP, and she is the author of this amazing book, Is It Me or My Hormones? The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly about PMS, perimenopause, and all the crazy things that occur with hormone imbalance. Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. For over 20 years, she's helped thousands of women restore their hormonal balance and start feeling more like themselves. So welcome, Marcel. Hello. Hello, hello. I'm glad to be here. Glad to be here. Yes. All right. So let's just get into it. So I was so excited reading your book that you are actually a doctor who discusses with women why they may be feeling the way they do, why they may be gaining weight and taking a natural approach and, and uh, balancing hormones instead of just in and out in five minutes and here, take these antidepressants or some pharmaceuticals or whatever. So this is so exciting. So you practice functional medicine. What is that? And you know, how, how do you practice? So here's the thing. Well, we know in medicine now, the way it works is you come in, you have a seven-minute appointment, they figure out what the diagnosis is, and they quickly then get you on, most of the time, an antibiotic or you know some type of medication. That doesn't really help people get better. Right. The whole goal of functional medicine is to understand biochemistry very well, yeah. anatomy and physiology very well. So you start to look at what's the cause of the cause. Right. right. You start to look at what's creating that problem, because we're all different. What's true for you and what's true for me can be very different. And even the symptoms might be the same, but the reason for those symptoms is going to be different. So I practice, as do all of my contemporaries that do functional medicine, I'm looking deeper into the equation. If somebody's having a lot of hot flashes or night sweats, I need to look at their diet. Mm -hmm. I need to look at their stress level. I need to look at adrenal function. And I need to look at what that hormonal cascade looks like so I can intervene and give them lifestyle changes, dietary changes, supplement changes that change the trajectory of what the symptoms look like going forward. Well, now those hot flashes, I remember when I, I was in my mid-40s and they started happening and then, you know, uh, now they're pretty, they're over really, but, but uh, are they something that's normal that it, there must be a reason for them or is it doing something, is it cleansing or clearing something or is it just Im not, imbalance? Not that no I wish it was <laughs> hot flashes are generally a symptom of a body that's a little bit out of balance okay when we go into menopause our hormones are changing obviously if estrogen was up here it's coming down and progesterone usually plummets down faster right. but it's that cascade of the up and the down that's causing the hot flashes now the things that make it worse for many people are huge amounts of stress mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. that their adrenals, which are our organs that really help us manage stress and get us in, in out of fight flight, if they've been maxed out for too long, they then really create more of the problem. So for many of my patients, I'll start with looking at adrenal function okay. because okay. adrenals really impact that imbalance of the hormones. Well, I remember even taking a couple sips of wine, I'd start be drenched, you know, with uh, coffee, which I loved. With, with, so there are triggers. Uh, Hands down. And also stress can yeah, do it, too. Stress. When you have that big meeting or you have that big, you know, workshop that you're going to be presenting in front of, right. that's when a lot of the cortisol epinephrine or epinephrine, they really trigger things then. And what happens then is that people feel so much worse. So it's finding ways, and in some ways, it's kind of wonderful, really, if you think about it, Marla, that our body's giving us the opportunity to say, oh, this is not working. Yeah. Things are not really balanced here. What do I need to do? How can I step back in my life and take a, a good look at what I need to do so that I can have my years ahead be really healthy and balanced? And that's really what this is all about, is how can you have a fantastic life? but also take care of yourself so that you can live longer and be healthier as you get older. Right. Well, you're talking about estrogen. So the estrogen's lowering, and that's that's a problem in balancing, right? So then what is, I get confused with this, then they say don't eat tofu because it raises the estrogen, or if a woman has extra weight on her, fat cells produce estrogen, and you can have more chance of breast cancer. So if we're losing the estrogen, then what's wrong with 
getting more estrogen. So uh, talk There's a little nothing bit. wrong with getting more estrogen. Let's be clear about this. Okay. What's really interesting about soy in particular okay. is that soy has been um, made into this terrible, terrible, terrible food. Now, the reality is, unfortunately, that most soy products are GMO, genetically yeah. modified, which is not good for us. But if we can get soy products that are not genetically modified, this is so interesting. Soy, if we have an estrogen receptor, imagine an estrogen receptor. We have an alpha part, which is where estrogen goes, and we have a beta part, which is where soy goes. So soy actually stops that receptor, so it may decrease symptoms of menopause. Mm -hmm. And for so many people, they don't understand it. It is not going to increase your risk of breast cancer. Soy does not increase your estrogen per se. It has estrogenic effects. Effects, okay, but it doesn't increase estrogen per se. Okay, so it's very confusing for people because they get so well. Am I supposed to eat it or not eat it, or is it going to cause breast cancer? Right, it is not going to do that. Other things may be contributing to that risk, but soy is not one of them. Okay. and in some countries, soy decreases their risk of breast cancer. Right. Like in Japan, they eat a, a different type of soy. Right, it's the Absolutely. soft or. So what kind should we eat? So I'm a vegan and, and uh, everybody says, oh, so you eat tofu. And so I'm like, well, not really, because then I was nervous about it being GMO. Yeah. Do I eat the, the veggie burger with made of tofu? Do I eat the tofu to ice cream? Do I eat the, you know, I, I'm like, what can I eat out of that? Of course. So the dance is always you get it as clean as possible. The unfortunate part is that we have a situation now in which so many of our foods are contaminated with pesticides, with toxins. So what I say to my patients is, look, you want to eat as colorful as you can. You want to have it be as organic as you can. If you don't know what to do organically and what not to, there's something called the Environmental Working Group that is fantastic at telling you what are the toxic 12 vegetables and, and fruits fruits that I need to stay away from. Organic beef and chicken, if you're eating, you know, meat products is going to be really important. You know, wild uh, things like uh, deer or moose are also very good for you. But basically, you want to stay as clean as you can. And here's the thing for so many women is what they put on their skin is yeah. so problematic. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. we in America don't have any guidance in terms of what's FDA evaluated. And in Europe, many of the things we put on our skin, and we don't even think twice about it, would never, ever be available in Europe because they have very strict guidelines about what's possible. Well, yeah, that brings me to summer's coming, and everybody's like, put on the sunscreen, slather it on. And I used to until Dr. Leonard Coldwell, I heard him say that sunscreen actually causes cancer because of the chemicals. And you're kind of yes. baking that in. So I stopped, and I'm very pale, yeah. you know, I'm a redhead, but, and I've had no problem. I don't lay out in the sun and sunbathe, but I walk around. I'm in Southern California, no sunscreen. I haven't had any problems, any burning, nothing. And I just let, and it's good to get that little sun on your skin for 20 minutes a day. So what do you feel about that? Is that sunscreen? you feel that it's dangerous? In fact, it's funny. I just met with my editorial staff this morning, and then my next article that's coming out um, tomorrow, I believe, is, is on sunscreens. Okay. So I completely agree with you. If you're going to be out in the sun from 10 to 4, which is when it's brightest, and you're really going to be baking out in it, yes, put a sunscreen on, but make sure it doesn't have any additives in it mm -hmm. um, or preservatives, because you're absolutely right. Everything we put on our skin gets absorbed into our skin yeah. and increases the toxic burden and the toxic load. They did a, a large study in Maine looking to see if, you know, 24-year-olds to 70-year-olds, did they have a toxic burden? And the answer, because Maine's pretty healthy, absolutely every single one of them did. The average newborn has, a, are you ready for this? 267 chemicals in its cord blood. Uh, just from but, all the but, DNA and the mother and everything, right? It's Exposures, absolutely. Yes. So we're, we're aware that we have a very toxic situation. So the more you can do to decrease that burden, mm -hmm. the more we know it increases and helps your health. And that's everything we do in functional medicine is we're always looking at, you know, what's the toxicity burden? What's the microbiome of the gut look like? Right. You know, right. What, what's happening with adrenal function? What's happening with nutrients? You know, your amino acids. That's all we, how we keep people healthy, especially women. We're looking sexier and more wonderful as we get older all the time. So that's yeah. what it's all about. And then, and then I, I, so we have a swimming pool at our house. And um, I tell my husband, put as minimal chemicals and chlorine in there as possible. But then I was reading something 
uh, on the internet yesterday about how dangerous chlorine is and in the pool. And I'm like, I can't chlorine. even swim. There's, unfortunately, there is a reality of that. We also, you know, we have chlorine in the water and right. we have, um, we also have fluoride in many of the water supplies. I recommend that people get a very good filter. I have a filter in my entire house. Mm -hmm. So it filters all the water. Right. Um, so that I'm not, when I'm taking a hot shower, I'm not getting the chlorine on me. Or you can even get filters for your individual showers. Yes. I've been trying to. So is as much as we can decrease exposure, the better. And they do, for your benefit, have new systems now for pools that salt water based. Uh -huh. right. You might want to look, look to see, you know, that. is there a way to convert that over or something like that? Because it is true, unfortunately, that chlorine is really not a great thing to add. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it goes so into anything we anything that touches our skin is absorbed. It so. is, and you know, the the truth is, I mean, a lot of people then get into this whole notion about. Well, you know, aren't we going overboard? And no, we're not. And here's why. Many of those things that you're talking about are what we call estrogen disruptors. Mm -hmm. It mimics in many ways estrogen in the body. So we've got all of these cascade of events that are happening because it's not really estrogen. We see that young girls are starting puberty at eight. We're seeing more infertility in men and women than we have in the history of mankind. And much of this we're seeing that's related to these concepts called estrogen disruptors. We use plastics in the microwave. I recommend oh, that you not do that. Right, no, you I never put hot food in a plastic container. You put it in a glass container. If you're drinking coffee, many people are have these great mugs yeah. that are metal, and then they have the plastic top. Yes. So if you're drinking, you're doing the same thing. So it needs to be a glass top right. or something that's not going to be plastic that you're going to be drinking. And all of this, it's not just one thing, Marla. It's the combination of that plus the Wi-Fi plus the toxicity plus the jet fuel we inhale when we go outside. It's all of it that's accumulated and the stress that we have. We and have what about, I want to ask about aluminum because I know we've got a lot of heavy metals. So even aluminum foil, putting it on your food or drinking out of aluminum cans, I stop yes, that. Terrible. Yeah. Terrible, terrible. Yeah. All of those are wonderful things that you're doing because a lot of times the things that are in the aluminum cans break down that aluminum so that you're drinking it. And when we, when I do an analysis and I'm looking at heavy metals, it's not unusual for have people to have high lead, high mercury, and high aluminum, mm -hmm. or um, you know, gadolinium that we get from MRI. So there's a lot of different things that we see that people are needing to detoxify with. And then we can certainly use nutrients and herbs. And I don't want people to be scared about this, but I want them to be aware right. that all of these things contribute to dis-ease. Mm -hmm. You know? yeah. And that we have sometimes have to work with somebody that's functionally trained to help them look at for you what is your issue? Is mercury tipping the scale for you? Or is your, your adrenals that are tipping the scale? Your digestive system tipping the scale? It's not just the hormonal imbalance, it's oftentimes coming from other things as well. Yeah, and, and that leads me to ask you about the thyroid. I, I meet so many women with uh, thyroid issues, hypothyroid, and um, that's, I would imagine, toxic. Uh, metals or chlorine absolutely or or toxic metals, metals. yep yeah. oftentimes it can be chlorine or bromide that are in the waters um also we have an iodine deficiency a lot of people are not using iodized salt which is not a bad thing necessarily but you need to make sure you get iodine mm -hmm. and also selenium because selenium is now replete in our food chain we don't have it in the in the soil so much anymore so we're seeing more and more people are selenium deficient in addition to that if you have a lot of stress what happens is that the thyroid stops functioning in the appropriate way. It doesn't convert properly to something called T3 or T3 is actually inactive. And we also see a lot of people with Hashimoto's thyroiditis, yeah. which yeah. is an autoimmune disorder that's coming from many of the things you just asked me about. Yeah. The toxicity, the food supply, the processed foods. And, you know, the average American consumes 22 teaspoons of sugar a day. Mm. Oh, my goodness. Day. Marla, that's a lot of sugar. That's crazy. It is crazy. And then, so that leads me to, I know certain women who are addicted to the diet sodas, and they'll drink uh -huh. all day long the diet sodas. And and I do know a couple of women who do that, and they do have issues with weight and with um, menopause symptoms worse, you know. It, so just speak to that. I'd love to share this video with people who are drinking the diet soda, and even is even one too much, and what is it doing to, to us? One is too much. Um, it's certainly better than five. 
But the reality is, unfortunately, what we know about many of the artificial uh, sweeteners, you know, the only ones that I'm really supportive of are xylitol, and there is something called Zevia, which is, you know, has no sugar in it. You can get it at the health food stores, um, and also uh, Stevia. Those are the things that I suggest my people use. All of the others have very significant, if you look at the research in rats and mice, very significant health risks associated with them. I have patients that have had horrible problems with what I call almost elephantitis in their legs with it, with uh, lymphatic problems. Mm -hmm. I haven't stopped the diet so it doesn't go away. People that have headaches. So it's again, it's not just you're going to get some health problem from the diet soda. It's what it does biochemically for you that's so problematic. Right. And it's again, it's an artificial the body doesn't know how to do anything with. And where for some people, some of the research is showing that actually that that artificial sweetener may actually increase blood glucose levels because the body's seeing it as sugar and it's responding in a similar way. And I think research will kind of come to fruition in the next couple of years to show us if that's true. But nonetheless, I'd rather somebody have the soda, even though I am I, I'm appalled at those. Right. That in Splenda because it's so dangerous for you. You know what I do? I've never been in, into soda, thank goodness, but you know what's really refreshing? If somebody's watching this and you're on that soda, I take Perrier and I take the, the concentrated cherry juice. You could buy a bottle for $20 that lasts like a month, and you pour some that cherry juice in there with the with the uh, Perrier, and it's so sure. delicious. It's a like cherry soda that with no Absolutely. added. Absolutely. They have um, machines now. You can actually make your own oh, um, yes, that, yeah. other water as well at home uh -huh. and add some lemon or some lime and right. even add some you know stevia to that I mean you can do it in your own way whatever is easier for you but I do that all the time when I'm going out also mm -hmm. that's what I drink right. and that certainly is a better thing for you than the sugar I mean sugar is so problematic in our culture mm -hmm. you know we have mm -hmm. so much sugar in everything if you look on the shelves in the grocery store right in front of you kind of pick up the you know whatever it is and it's like sugar Fourteen. Oh, yeah. Grand. The first, ingredient, oh, my first God. ingredient will be, you know, yeah, fructose exactly. or corn, corn syrup. syrup or, or, yeah, or sugar, exactly. Yeah. High fructose corn syrup. So it's really endemic in our culture, and unfortunately, it's very seductive. I mean, you have a little bit, and you want a little bit more, and the the food manufacturers know that. I mean, they're not stupid, and they put it in, in you know, many of the chips now. It's got a little sweetener taste, and you kind of want more because it really tastes good, and. Rats and mice oftentimes go towards sugar as opposed to cocaine and heroin. It turns on the same receptors in the brain, so that's not a good thing. No, but once you clean it out, do a cleanse or something, you won't want, want it. It's the taste buds will reset, and you won't be – you'll you're taste not it. You'll think it's anymore. too much. Yeah, it's like, oh. Absolutely. Right. It's absolutely true. And then the sugar concentration is like, whoa, oh, my goodness, I can't believe. Oh, you eat that? Yeah. So when the thyroid, uh, I know some doctors will put women on thyroid medication for the rest of their life. Now, do you believe that, or do, what's your thoughts on this? Look, there, um, there, can you some, naturally some, reset you, that? or? Yeah. yeah, you can. But the reality is if, if your uh, thyroid TSH is so high, then it's really dangerous to continue to have it that high. So, of course, those people need to be on supplementation. Yeah. But those people that are just starting to see the shifts in their TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, those are people that can oftentimes change their diet, yes. do an anti-inflammatory diet, um, stop the artificial color sweeteners dyes, and also then start adding some selenium, 200 micrograms a day mm -hmm. to their food, and use iodine as well, You know, sometimes up to 3,000 micrograms a day. And that change in and of itself can make a huge difference for the thyroid. And then you start watching those numbers come back down. So that's not unusual at all. And if you don't want to take the selenium, what you can do is take two Brazil nuts a day and we'll do the same thing. Wonderful. I know it's kind of a quick trick. Yeah. But those are things that make a big difference. And I see so many people in my practice, but you have to be watching it along the way. If you start to notice, oh, it's starting to climb before it's so high, we don't really have a choice. That's the time to make the adjustments. And a good breakfast for women, I saw you have on your website, marcelpick.com, is the, I, which I make every day, chia seed pudding. It's That's so perfect. easy. You pour some chia seeds in, in a little, you know, glass uh, jar with some yeah. almond milk. I put cacao and nut and um, some uh, fruit, berries, yeah. banana, a uh, little stevia, 
shake it up, put it in the fridge, and in the morning it's you've got your breakfast, and it's so much better than than bread or donuts or bagels or. Uh, and it fills you up. I mean, it fills it's also you up. Fiber, protein, fiber. Absolutely. Everything. So it's fantastic for you. No I know. Question. I love it. I've been eating even at night when I'm watching some TV with my hubby. I'll go get my chia seed pudding, and it's like I'm addicted. It's like oh, a dessert. It is. It's like some a dessert. Oh, no question. If you put some banana in it, it's really it's delicious. Banana. Yeah, I've it's... been putting fresh cherries, strawberries, um, goji berries. Of yeah. course, you can put and anything you know, in there. Strawberries now. It's like yeah. ooh, what a treat. No. I know that's great. So the weight gain now, calorie cutting. That's probably just not going to cut it, right? It's it's balancing those hormones and getting the it's, it's, well, it's more complicated than that. And I think the unfortunate part for so many women is that they've been really taught it's calories in, calories out. Yes. And if you look at a calories of um, you know 100 calories of broccoli versus 100 calories of a donut, the way the body deals with them is gonna be completely different. So it's the quality of the food that you're eating. Yeah. And what I say to people is, I'm not so concerned initially if you're gaining some weight at how many calories, but I want you to be more mindful of the quality of the food and have much as much color as possible, have good protein, you know, the size of the palm of your hand at lunch and dinner, and then also have really good quality, you know, fats guacamole, avocado, you know, olive oil, those kinds of things. If you still are not having any luck losing weight, then we might have to dig in a little bit more to find out is there something called weight loss resistance, which means perhaps the adrenals are off, perhaps the digestive system's off, perhaps the hormones are off, perhaps you're not detoxing properly, perhaps you've got some, you know, I call it my last chapter in one of my books is are you issues in your tissues? Because that stress response and protection can sometimes keep that weight on as well. So sometimes we have to dig a little deeper to find out what it is. And so many women get frustrated because somebody's telling them, we well, just eat less. And they're thinking to themselves, I'm eating 1,000 calories a day. What else can I do? So it's really looking at what's the problem. Some of those people are eating too little. And then what about the um, – I've heard that the toxin, the fat – holds those toxins in there to keep them away from your organs. So unless, if you cleanse and do a cleanse maybe for the toxins, then sure. that your body can release those. And, and Absolutely. There seems to be an association between people that have weight in the middle. In the belly, That's yeah. Oftentimes and hormones or adrenals. Um, certainly diabetes is that as well. And people that have a little bit more kind of in their hips and their thighs, yeah. oftentimes you'll find that they're a little bit more what we call toxic in that way. And mm -hmm. I know it sounds a little new agey, this whole notion of toxicity, but right. there is a reality to it. You know, we have a lot of exposure to a lot of things these days and our body is not really well developed in being able to, to get that out of our system because it's so much at yeah. one time. And stepping up the exercise, I know myself in my fifties and I, I sit at my desk working and I, you know, all my, my, all my work is sitting so I'm up walking the dog twice I go to the gym I jump in the pool I you I have to make that effort or the pounds a few pounds will start creeping up if I'm not really moving I know yeah, and, and for sure that's important because I'm at metabolic function changes a little bit as well yeah. but the other part that's so important that you're so aware of is that as we get older we need to be more mindful of building that muscle because yeah. that helps with you know, metabolic functioning helps us sleep and also has the ability and reserve to be able to keep that muscle strength there, which is what we need as we get older, too. All of those things are right. Okay, I just got a, a thought. Calcium. Women think they have to take these calcium supplements for the bones, but that's not correct, is it? Well, there's some truth to that and some not. Of course, we need to have calcium in our diets, and we need to be mindful that we need to have foods that are really consistent with health. I don't think that having 1,500 um, milligrams of calcium a day is probably the best idea. Perhaps around 18 or 800 and then 400 of magnesium, but many people need more than 400 of magnesium because the stress levels are so high. Mm -hmm. Magnesium, the B vitamins, those are crucial for us in terms of our health and well-being. The more stress we have, the more we get those vitamins deplete. The best way to get calcium is in the food supply. Right. So, you know, foods. Those chia um, seeds and the leafy green, right? The chia, chia. Yeah. <laughs> ch 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 yeah. chia. And I'm making a soup with, you know, things like Swiss chard and spinach and mm -hmm. collards and, uh, you know, all the greens that you can find, kale. Those are things that are fantastic for you. You can just whip up either a cold soup or a warm soup, depending upon the season, mm -hmm. and then have that on a regular basis. Those are really important things to do. Oh, my God, that sounds so good. I'm going to go make that. <laughs>
Well, the carrot in it. Yes, that sounds, it's a day. It's really good. That sounds so good. Okay. So before I let you go, we've got to talk about something which scares me and freaks me out so bad and makes me want to scream because I'm with my cell phone all day long and my computer. That's how I work. I mean, it's the best device ever because I'm learning, you know, different languages on there, podcasts and uh, pictures and Facebook and texting and calling. Yeah, and we've got a technology now that we're almost addicted to it as well. Yes. And then I always talk about in my books, you know, taking a, a Sabbath you know, a sabbatical from electronics and really doing it routinely, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or you close it at five o'clock or because our system is so bombarded with this There's a good part to that, which keeps our brain function, which really helps in the way of prevention of Alzheimer's as well. One of the things there's many things that can, but the, the piece to the equation is how much are we having that quiet time? For example, I lose power here a lot. Mm -hmm. And when the electricity's out, it's like you really can't do very much of anything. Right. You can read by the candle and you can calm down and put the prior on perhaps, but those are things that we just don't do anymore because we're always so busy. So the upside to it is you are right. You can learn languages, you can get excited about friends and so on, yeah. but the downside is that we're always on yeah. and then we have problems with sleep and all kinds of things. So I think there's a balance there and of course, Anytime you have a chance, and also for men, do not put it in your pocket close to your, you know, pros your penis and your yeah, testicles. Yeah, they don't have that down there. Put it in your back pocket. Or, or the women putting it in their bra or They're, something. Oh, my God. No, 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 no. And don't so, do okay, so the earbuds, then that, is that, I mean. Put it in your purse. You know, have a long enough right. cord that you put the phone in your purse. So if the uh -huh. earbuds, does that, is that perfectly safe or are you still getting some radiation? There's no such thing as perfectly safe, okay. Marl. There just isn't. And, you know, the other piece to it that we don't even talk about is we all have our houses with Wi-Fi in it. Everywhere we go now, we get annoyed if there's no Wi-Fi. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, the planes, when you're going on an airplane, they're Wi-Fi. Well, yeah. oh, my God, what's that doing now? We don't know. Right. We do know there's an association with some of the brain cancers and people that are constantly on the phone. Is it the only thing that causes it? Of course not. But is it a contributing factor that may be problematic? Absolutely. There's no question. And unfortunately, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't feel it. We just think it's not there. It is there. Yeah. You know, a lot of times we also have the meters now on the electric meter. So that's another form of Wi-Fi. Mm. So it's kind of everywhere. Well, yeah, it's uh, strange times we're living in. It's There's so many amazing things to help us, but at the same time, they can hurt us. So we've just got to, sometimes I just, because I'm one of those kind of health nuts, you know, I really am... Uh, in doing my cleanses and the vegan and exercising and yoga and meditation. But I just, sometimes I try not to think about it. I'm like, I can't do anything about all these bombardments of talks. I can't. So I just say, don't think about it today. <laughs> I agree with you, Marla. I think that we do the best we can and that we sit back and say, I'm taking care of myself in all the ways that I know yeah. and how, you know, how proud I am that I'm doing that. And not get into the whole thing about, oh, my God, what about this? And I haven't done anything. Right. It's like, that's not really helpful. And it's there's a, a piece that we haven't even talked about, and that is the psychology of all this. Okay. You know, okay. getting all wrapped up in the anxiety of, oh, my God, I've got to. It's like, that's also not good for us. Yeah, because so then it's on the forefront, and we can create it by focusing on it, right? Totally. And so how do we really learn to be present in the moment today? Yesterday has already happened, right. tomorrow isn't here yet, and we have an ability to create tomorrow in a different way, but it's about being in the present now and doing the best you can, and we all, I think, are trying to do that, some more than others. I mean, you're very conscientious, which I adore, because I do the same thing, <laughs> right. but um, there are still no guarantees. Yeah, you know? that's right. Yeah, because people will say, oh, this person, this woman that I know got cancer, and she was a yoga teacher, and she was a vegan, and she did this and that, and, and this person ate like crap, and they live to be a hundred. Well, but you know, it, we, we don't, we, we have no prediction of tomorrow, yeah. but we do know from science that most of the time, all the things you're talking about are making a difference. Yeah. And we do know that we're bombarded with more than we've ever been before. So taking those steps and I see it differently in my practice, Marl, I see people that really do take care. If they get cancer, it's a better cancer generally. You know, is that always true? Of course not. It's never always true for anything. Right. But the predictors seem to be, you know, in the favor for those people that are mindful and taking care of their body. And, you know, cancer loves sugar. Yes. I mean, it loves sugar and stress. That's another piece to the puzzle. 
So um, all of that is connected. There was a very large study done called the ACE study. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Are you familiar with no. it? It was looking at adverse childhood events in our childhood. And it, it looked um, at 19,000 men and women from Kaiser Permanente. And it's still an ongoing study. It's the longest study in the history of medicine. And they looked to see if you had a lot of stress as a kid, mm-hmm. you know, a single parent home, a parent that was an alcoholic, you didn't feel loved, you were, you know, you, you saw your mother, and, you know, hurt. Sexual abuse, physical abuse, of course, all those things. If you had four of those things in your home, Mm -hmm. did that do anything to your health long term? And the results were, oh, my God. And the results showed that your risk of heart disease is 140% higher. Stroke, 125% higher. Suicide, 1,200% higher. So we know that that kind of stress increases cortisol. Right which increases the adrenal function, which changes our thyroid, changes our immune system, changes glucose control, changes our fluid, everything. So there is a relationship also to how we think and how we live our lives. That's all connected with everything else that you're talking about today. Well, well, Marcel, thank you so much for popping by and talking about all these amazing Absolutely. Uh, gosh, we learned so much. We could talk all day. But um, yes, your, everybody, her links are below. And uh, check out her book, Is It Me or My Hormones? It is amazing. And uh, much love, everybody. Until next time. Bye. Bye.